Go West, welcome to the Western Movies Podcast. Howdy cowboys and cowgirls. My name is Cole Armin, aka Vincent. I am your host and also the co-founder of the French website westernmovies.fr. Since 2004, we've been writing through the Western, its films, actors, directors, and many more. You can watch our previous podcasts, including one with Toby Rohn about the 1960 film Flaming Star on westernmovies.fr, our YouTube channel, as well as Apple and podcast platforms. Tonight, I have the great pleasure to welcome John Kay to the Western Movies podcast. Hi, John. How are you today? I'm very well, Vincent. Thank you very much. And let me just uh, state uh, um, thank you very much for... Uh, let me um, join in. Um, I, I love your site, by the way. Uh, the Western Movies uh, site is great. I love the screen grabs that you do for, and the comparisons. And um, it saves me a lot of money because your reviews are very good and very authentic. And um, you do um, show the forks in films or sometimes a Blu-ray comes out. There's not much of an improvement on the DVD. Um, this isn't always the film companies fault they're compromised by the um material the source material that they're given but i find the way your site uh, you know analyzes everything and, and the comparisons are, are wonderful so it, it's a go-to site um every time i'm online I, I go into western movies um and also i look forward to knowing what's coming out in the future in fact sedonis uh, seem to be the last ditch stand for kind of you know um westerns that aren't that well known i mean most most of the film companies that are releasing westerns now seem to be concentrating on the superstars you know the, the coke douglas burt lancaster Gregory peck robert mitchum but the sort of rory calhouns the george montgomery's the william elliott's they, they rod cameron's so they they seem to you don't get much of that released, and Sedonis are the only, um, you know, film company at the moment that regularly putting out westerns by what I would call second string stars. I mean, they've got a very rare western coming up soon called California Conquest um, with Cornell Wilde and Teresa Wright. Uh, I don't think this has ever been on Blu-ray before, and it's just gems like that that uh, you know a lot of us western fans really, really like. Some of these. Uh, minor films uh, sometimes better than the a films i'm not saying in in particular california conquest because it's it's not a great western but it's got great photography from ellis carter and some really neat location work and corner wide actually liking westerns anyway so it's just great they're still releasing these um little known films so I appreciate that. Well, thank you, uh, uh, John, for these kind words. Uh, it really means a lot to us. Yes, I, I do agree that uh, now even Kino Lorber in the United States are uh, focusing on more uh, marketable, more uh, mainstream films. And uh, ultimately, all these uh, Republic films and Paramount Pictures that we used to have at Kino and Olive Films are, are gone. And... Uh, it's sad. There's Paramount Channel, in, at least here in France, that uh, uh, that aired uh, Hellfire and a few other uh, westerns like that that are very rare. But uh, I've lost hope that they will be released uh, anytime soon. Yes, the Paramount Film Library, as you know, it, they they, um, they own all the Republic titles, um, and also uh, Republic in the. 1960s they bought a whole heap of allied artists monogram films uh, most of the allied artist titles are, are owned by warner brothers and warner archive have put out virtually all the allied artist westerns that they own i mean all the cinemascope ones the joel mccrae's and george montgomery's they put out some very very good releases don't smoke in two songs which is pretty rare with mark stevens but unfortunately with with the um you know, the bulk of um, titles sold to uh, Republic. There's some great titles there, like Dragoon Wells Massacre, um, Jack Slade, and uh, Alfred Workers at Gunpoint, who, which we'll go on to later. But, yeah, there's a, and, and John McRae's The Tall Stranger. These are all lying in the, the Paramount vaults now. They're, they're all tied up with the Republic uh, 
deals. So um, unless somebody can work miracles and uh, get hold of some of these films, I mean, the masters for the Allied Artists stuff that Warner put up were in very good shape uh, generally. So we hope that there's good masters of things like Gunpoint and Jack Slade and Dragoon World's Massacre. A lot of fans would like to see these titles released. Uh, I, I think really Sedonis are the only ball game in town because th these are the kind of westerns that Sedonis um, hone in on. And of course, Koch Germany used to be a gold mine for westerns, but they, they, you know all these rare universal titles that they put it, the programmer kind of westerns. But um, you know, that, uh, Koch in Germany now are very quiet. They, they've hardly put a western out for ages, which is quite sad because I, I've got loads of Koch films. They're, they're good transfers and things like A Day of Fury and um, Star in the Dust and these kind of lovely programmers that Universal did so well. And to see these films on Blu-ray also was was kind of, uh, you know, I never thought we'd ever see a film like Star in the Dust on, on Blu-ray. Um, yes. But unfortunately, that's a thing of the past. So you're a big fan of Westerns and a recurring participant on the 50 Westerns from the 50s blog uh, from Toby Rome. Yes, okay. indeed. Yes. Can you talk a bit about yourself and how you became a, a fan of Western and cinema? Yeah, well, I was born in 1946. So um, obviously, you know, I, I, through the 50s, I, I, I saw a load of Westerns. Um, and I vividly remember going with my parents to see a lot of the Andy Mann classics like uh, Bend of the River and The Far Country and The Man from Laramie in particular. And, uh, yeah, I mean, I remember seeing The Command in Cinemascope. That, that was quite a an evening out because it was the first Cinemascope Western, I believe. And, uh, and I remember seeing things like Hondo in 3D, which, again, was quite an experience. But um, I also, you know, when I was in my like, early teens, when I was sort of about 12, 13, I, I, I was, um, you know, a huge sci-fi um, horror uh, fantasy type fan. And the early 60s were a boon time for fans of these sort of movies because you had the Hammer films, the Roger Corman, Vincent Price films, the Ray Harryhausen films. The Herman Cohen, they were a bit schlocky, but they were great fun films. Uh, William Castle, we had a, he, all of these films. And in, in the UK, you couldn't get in to see Hammer films. They all had X certificates. So um, when these earlier films come out, the Quatermass films, and I couldn't get in to see them, um, So which, uh, you know, um, annoyed me incredibly. But by the time I, I got... To 13, I, I was able to pass the 16, so I was catching up with a lot, lost time. I was seeing all these wonderful Hammer films that, that I'd missed, and some of the AIP things. I mean, even the thing like Attack of the 50 Foot Woman, which is laughable now, but 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 you know, it's uh, unbelievable. You had to be over 16 to see a film like that, and uh, other things like The Black Scorpion. So I was transfixed by these posters. I used to go through the underground on a day out with my parents. I, mean, I was looking at these posters, lurid posters for Quatermass 2 and the Black Scorpion. And wow, you know, wouldn't I love to see that? And of course, it wasn't until I turned about 13, I, I was tracking all these things down. So the Westerns kind of got sidetracked. Um, you know, I, I, I just, um, Vincent Price was the, 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 the number one guy to go to. I was tracking down all his movies and, um, and I kind of forgot about the Westerns. And it was... Um, Really, an article in, in Motion magazine, early 1963, um, some articles by um, Chris Wicking, who, who later became a pretty renowned screenwriter, and Raymond Dergnet, Dernault, I don't know how he, but he, he was a great influence. And Chris Wicking did a great uh, um, article on the Bedeker films. I had seen Bedeker, I'd, I'd seen uh, Buchanan Rice alone. And I'd seen Westbound, but I hadn't seen any of the others. Um, so uh, Chris's article kind of said, oh, I'm missing something here. And, you know, I probably OD'd on fancy horror movies, you know, because there was so much of so it. Maybe the Western needs another kind of, um, you know, look at. And I, I started, you know, Chris's uh, article kind of, yeah, about Bedeker, that, that, this guy sounds interesting. And, I um and Raymond Dern, Dernett, um did, did quite a a good thing on Western as well and he, he was on he 
he wrote a very good piece on Jack and the Stranger on Horseback. I thought, wow, this, this sounds good. And so, yeah, I started, because um, these films are all still going around the, you know, repertory cinemas. And, and at that time, I mean, Chris uh, and, and friends founded a, um, a film club called the Eyeview Film Society. And um, it was based in Bayswell. I was still at school, actually. I was 16 at the time. And, uh, and uh, of course, they, they were showing some pretty rare films um, at the at the Eyeview. And, of course, I, I went along and joined up, you know, after school and along to Bayswater and met all these wonderful people, film fans, and got to know Chris pretty well. But I, I was always... I mean, Chris was an intellectual, unlike me, is very highly educated, but he had this um, love of B-Westerns, not only like the Bedeker films, but the the, um, the series B, you know, the Altries and the Rogers and Johnny McBrowns and Tim Holtz. And he had a real love for, for those sort of films. So I kind of learned a lot from him, really. And he, he really liked Leslie Sealander. And he kind of, he wrote a very good piece about Shotgun and, I, I, at first, I thought, "What's a guy like Chris worry, worrying about somebody like Leslie Sealander for?" And um, but when you see, see some of the movies, you think, "Yeah, wow." Um, but Chris was always kind of uh, ahead of the curve. I mean, he, he was only twenty at the time, you know. And, um, you know, he was writing all this amazing stuff, and he, he was just twenty year old. And uh, and then he went on to have this fabulous um, screenwriting career. So that was kind of in a nutshell. And, and the eye view was wonderful because. They, uh, when the science fiction season had run its course, they just showed a load of other incredibly rare films. So it was a great education. And, uh, you know, you, you're around sort of kindred spirits who, who, who like the same sort of stuff. So that's a, in a nutshell, or maybe, maybe more than a nutshell, really, but that, that's uh, what, what reignited my interest in the Western. I, I owe a lot to Chris Wicking because I, I was very impressed by his writing and his just love for all aspects of the Western, you know. Um, including the, the B series. In fact, it, it's funny. I mean, a lot of people look down on like the Altries and the Rogers and Tim Holtz and Johnny McBrowns as a sort of subculture. But you know, a lot of highly intelligent people really like these movies. You know, a lot of people I've met over the years are really into these movies. So you can't sort of turn your nose at them, really. I mean, every genre, you know, deserves its its degree of respect, I guess if that makes any sense. Yes, great. That's a great story. Thank you. Do you have a, a memory of discovering a Western that you'd like to share? Um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've always liked Westerns. I mean, most of the Westerns I saw, you know, as a child were the A Westerns, really. I mean, I wasn't going around all the flea bit cinemas sort of looking for like George Montgomery Westerns or, you know, that, that came later. In about 1963, I, I saw Wichita, at one of the Asoldo cinemas, and I had a lovely cinemascope screen. And it just, um, it, it, I mean, Wichita with Joel McCrane, I thought, wow, this, this is really great. You know, it was from the film I saw on its first run. And so, um, you know, I started seeking all these allied artists, Westerns, and I was able to see Jacques Deneuve's Marvelous Canyon Passage, which was still running around the flea pit sort of cinemas, you know, some of these, cinemas even in the 60s were still showing 1940s movies and um but what uh Wichita made a great a great impact on me I found it was quite a you know a, a really powerful little movie I mean Jack Deneau to me is one of the masters but um you can't go wrong with any of his films really and uh, and, and Wichita kind of re reignited the kind of films I was looking for the the programmers and the not the, you know, the big, you know, I, I'd seen all the Anthony Manns, obviously, and, the, you know, the Kirk Douglases and all that kind of film, but now I was seeking out the um, the second string stars and obviously greats like Scott and McRae. So, you know, I had a lot to occupy my mind. So, yeah, that, that's um, that's about it, really, on, on, on that front. Yeah, I've always loved Westerns, but I did have this... Um, thing where I veered off westerns and you know like most kids uh, the fantasy sort of films and the horrors and the, the hammers and the Roger Corman so and that was a golden era for those sort of films when I was growing up so I think any kid would have been uh, distracted you know having all those films hit you at once so. I think you must appreciate the powerhouse indicator releases 
in terms of Hammer, uh, William Castle, and the Baedeker. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the Bedeker box, and it's so glad. It's so encouraging to see that sold out pretty quickly. In fact, it sold out quicker than some of the hammers. So that that was quite encouraging. Um, I hope they, it'd been wonderful if they would do. I mean, I don't think the market would would absorb it, but if they did one edition on um, Columbia Westerns. I've actually emailed them. Uh, hadn't had a. They don't always reply to my emails. They probably fed up with me, but. Um, I suggested putting films like The Last Posse, um, Three Hours to Kill, Reprisal, um, you know, The Hard Man and films like that, you know, the, the, the lesser known films. That's I mean, Reprisal is, is a wonderful film. It's kind of, it's an anti-racist Western, really, which I think um, maybe a lot of people aren't into programming Westerns might, might see that from a kind of historical point of view. It's quite a brave film for, for its time. But yeah, I'm a big George German fans. So. Tonight, you chose to talk about Alfred Worker. I think this is a great opportunity for you to shed some light on this not very well-known director, at least in France. I couldn't find a lot of writing about him, uh, yet his contrib contributions include many gems in the film noir and Western genres, among other ones, mm -hmm. that you will talk about. He made around 50 films as a director. Um, before we start with his career, can you tell us what drew you to choose Alfred L. Worker for this podcast? What amazed me is that, I mean, he wasn't particularly known for Westerns. I mean, I, he, he goes right back to the silent era. I think he did at least one silent Western, and he did a few sort of B Westerns with George O'Brien, but he wasn't like a Western specialist by any stretch of the imagination. But towards the tail end of his career, he did six westerns, more or less, on the trot, which, which was quite unusual. I mean, his last film wasn't a western. He, he, there was a thing in 1957 called The Young Don't Cry with uh, Salmoneo, James Whitmore, and J. Carroll Nash. I've never seen that. It sounds interesting, to say the least. But apart from his last film, he just did these six westerns. And they're all, they're all unusual westerns, and they're sort of what I call bread and butter westerns. They're the sort of programmer type westerns that kept the genre going really i mean i wouldn't say any of them are classics um and the only one i would call outstanding is the last posse which i think is a phenomenal um you know program or western and it's very much like a noir because it's told totally in flashbacks um and it's beautifully shot by bernard guffey uh, some wonderful location work is in Lone Pine, but all the other Westerns he made, they, they've all got something. And, and I hope that um, they, um, you know, find that three of them have been released on DVD. I hope um, the donors put, give us a Blu-ray of The Last Posse because it certainly deserves it. It looks stunning in, in high definition. Um, and hopefully the other three unreleased worker Westerns will find their way to, um, you know, Blu-ray or, or DVD as well. The only guy I've ever known who, who wrote anything, I mean, I'm sure there have been others, but the only one who's written anything um, positive about Alfred L. Worker is uh, Lou Lumenek, who is who used to be the critic of the New York Post. He, he's retired now, but he, he was the uh, head critic of the New York Post, a very good film critic as well, but he, he considered Worker underrated. So, you know, that, and I would agree um, yeah, I, I would say, I mean, I'm not saying he's some great alter waiting rediscovery, but he's a sort of good, solid genre movie maker and maybe deserves a bit more respect than, than he's getting at the moment, perhaps. Can we start at the beginning of his career? I mean, the beginning with, with, with you know, he, he comes from silent movies. Um, he did a lot of B movies. I haven't seen a lot of his pre-1939 movies, but his big hit, the early big hit, was the second of Fox's um, period uh, Sherlock Holmes movies, The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, because Fox, before Universal, did two very good um, period uh, Sherlock Holmes movies set in the proper Holmes era. And The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes is a very good movie. Um, it was visually very striking. It did, it did show workers' visual style, and the end, I mean, the end section set in the um, Tower of London 
um, leans very heavily to German expressionism. I mean, I know a lot of that's down to the art director, obviously, and the, the, the cinematographer, but it, it is a visually very interesting movie. But after, you know, this hit movie, um, Fox seemed to just give work for a load of B-movies, really nondescript B-movies, just that whole, you know, that his, uh, maybe he didn't get on with Daryl Zanuck. I don't know what, what reason it was, but he didn't progress after the adventures of Sherlock Holmes. He just did all these kind of programmers, incredibly nondescript ones, really. I mean, the only one that I've never seen but interests me very much is a thing called Shock with um, Vincent Price and Lynn Barry. But again, the 70 minute running time means, means it's a B movie. Um, but the fact that Worker directed it and Vincent Price is in it means it must have funding going for it. So uh, that's one I'd like to see. And I don't really think his career caught fire again and, until um, Eagle Lion. Um, a couple of films he, he did for Eagle Lion, but the, the Fox thing didn't really pan out for him as I guess it should have, uh, especially after superb job he did on the, the Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. Is, I think it's a wonderful Holmes picture. Adventures of Sherlock Holmes stars um, Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce and uh, Ida Lupino as well. It's, uh, yes. I believe, the first of a series of uh, 14, I think, films. Uh, with Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce, that I like a lot. Yes, um, I mean, Fox made two, uh, they were like A-movies, um, The Hound of the Baskervilles and The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. And then um, Universal sort of decided to make a whole series of B-movies. But what they wanted to do was bring Holmes into the you know 20th century. And you had things, and, and apparently Rathbone was quite agreeable to... Uh, updating Holmes, so you had things like Sherlock Holmes versus the Nazis. And, but they're, they're, very, they're fun movies. They're, they're, and one called The Scarlet Claw is outstanding because it's, uh, it, it's an exceptionally good film. But I like them all. They're, they're all very good. Uh, but there's a couple that punch above their weight, above their B-movie kind of weight. And the thing with Universal is their B-movies normally always had A production values. So they look good, even with some of their West, you know, forties westerns. They, 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 you couldn't fault them on on, on production values. And the uh, the um, Sherlock Holmes uh, Universal films are very nice looking movies, and very entertaining. So, yeah, um, but as I, as I say, the the, the two Fox um, Sherlock Holmes were, were were proper period films set in the um, 19th century. So. And he also directed a comedy with Laurel and Hardy called A Hunting We Will Go. Yes, absolutely. I mean, but unfortunately, um, I mean, this is the sort of thing that work was kind of reduced to, really, because Laurel and Hardy made a series of films for Fox which were, you know, way below their whole Roach films. And the trouble is um, they had no creative control over over these movies and most Lauren Hardy fans uh, you know they they're, they're not very well regarded you know compared to their classic movies and the Fox um, films are for completists only I mean some of them have got their own sort of charm but Lauren Hardy were kind of they were stuck with a studio that wouldn't give them con creative control so they, they were just um, there to you know trading on their names and it was hardly a sort of a a major film, for, you know, especially after the events of the Sherlock Holmes, that this uh, rather weak. Um, I haven't seen it. I, I tend to avoid the uh, Lauren Hardy Fox films. I don't like seeing my heroes, um, you know, in 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 subpar films, and you know, they they uh, they're they're a sad reflection on on their earlier films, which a lot of them are a masterpiece. And of course, the wonderful short movies they did, which uh, you know will live forever. But you know, haunting. Um, we will go maybe the less said about that, the better. Yeah, I mean, I, I thought that Alfred Worker kind of, um, he, his, mood, his directing career kind of got back into gear with, with a couple of films for Eagle Lion. Um, sadly, one of the movies, um, a lot of it is uh, attributed to Anthony Mann. He Walked by Night, which I think is an absolutely yeah, outstanding film noir. It's a police procedural film, um, a, a, a film noir. But um, unfortunately, that not 
there's no record on the Eagle line to say what Anthony Mann directed and what um, Alfred Worker directed, uh, you know, because um, it's one of those frustrating films with, with two directors that, you know, there are many, I mean, you know, like Death of a Gunfighter or, or um, The Garment Jungle, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you go on and on. But yeah. um, Arnold Laban, uh, 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 again, later a fine director himself, he was working at Evil, Eagle Lion. And he maintains that Anthony Mann just directed the storm drain sequences. At the end of the movie, there's this wonderful um, thing in the storm drains where they're pursuing Richard Basart through the, through the storm drains. But the rest of it, I, I guess, you know, was out of his work. I mean, Arnold Laven, as far as, you know, he, as far as he remembers, and he was around Eagle Island at that time, that man did direct the uh, storm drain sequences. But, but the whole movie is good. I mean, there's not a flat shot in the whole film. And, of course, it's shot by the great John Alton as well. So it's a shame, in a way, that one of Worker's best films, um, you know, a lot of the credit goes to Anthony Mann, which, which is... You know, not because the Storm Drain Six is very good, but the the whole film is very very good. It's a, a sensational film noir, and anyone I, I highly recommend the Classics Flicks um, Blu-ray. It is a beautiful restoration of He Walked by Night, and Bayside is absolutely wonderful. Um, it's great. Cool. But the other film um, at Equal Line is Repeat Performance, which is kind of at the moment a lost movie. Um, I've only seen a horrible like DVD, which is transferred from VHS, which, which is, you know, looks like it's filmed for a, a load of medieval murk. It's horrible, but you can see that it's a visually very striking movie. Um, and that it's rumoured, I I'm, I'm hope it's true, that it's going to get uh, remastered and, and, and released on Blu-ray. Um, repeat performance is a film noir, but it's got fantasy elements. Um, it's kind of like a 90-minute Twilight Zone um, episode it, it, with Joan Leslie and um, uh, Louis Hayward, Richard Basehart. I think it was Basehart's first film. Um, but it's a tremendously good film. And, of course, work hasn't got the spectre of Anthony Mann or, in fact, John Alton hovering over him on that one. I mean, he can get a lot more kudos for what is a sensationally good-looking film noir. And I hope when it gets released, if it does get Really, so I've heard on very good authority it's going to be. Um, it might sort of raise his reputation not to. It's a very, it's probably one of his very best films, an excellent film with a, a fantasy undertone as well. What's interesting is that uh, Anthony Mann and uh, Worker had a lot of similarities as they, they both started making film wars at Eagle Lion. And then they did westerns and excelled in westerns as well, and used uh, the wonderful John Alton for the photography. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, the talent that went through Eagle Line in, in the late forties. I mean, it was a sort of, you know, for a brief few years, it was a breeding ground for exceptional talent. You had guys like Brian Foy and Cray, Crane Wilbur. I mean, they'd been around a hell of a you know a long time. I mean, Crane Wilbur goes right back to the silent era. And uh, Brian Foy had a tremendous um, tenure at Warner Brothers, maybe on their B picture unit. But then after Eagle Line collapsed, they went on to Warner Brothers and made a whole lot. I mean, they, um, Crane Wilbur wrote and uh, Brian Foy produced House of Wax, which was uh, a mega smash for um, Warner Brothers. And they did some very good films at Warner Brothers, both as a team and, and, and um, separately. So that, that when they uh, left Eagle Lion, um, there, there, there was no holding them back, really. So, um, but you had other you had other people um, through Eagle Line. You had, like I mentioned, Arnold Laban, who again became a very good director. He made some very good couple of very good westerns, I, I think, um, and, and and some very couple of very good noirs as well. I think Without Warning and Down Three Dark Streets and things like that. So he he, he kind of was, um, you know, getting his start at. Um, at uh, Eagle Line, and of course you had Hal W. Koch and Aubrey Schenk, uh, who later formed Bel Air Pictures. Um, now, Hal W. Koch, uh, one of his earliest credits was working on a Leslie Salander Eagle Line B Western. He, he was Salander's assistant, and of course when he formed um, 
Bel Air pictures in the early 50s. So Lander became his sort of house director, um, Bel Air's house director. He, um, C. Lander directed most of the Bel Air westerns. Um, and of course, uh, Howard W. Koch went on to great things. He, he had a long working relationship with Frank Sinatra. And in the early 60s, he, he became um, head of production at Paramount. Um, so, you know, he'd he gone from Leslie Slander's assistant to virtually running Paramount. And I'm pretty sure it's how W. Koch had brought in Slander at the tail end of his career to direct a few of the um, A.C. Lyles westerns. They found that Slander did what I consider the best of the A.C. Lyles, Town Tamer with Dana Andrews, certainly had the best cast. It's also kind of nice that how W. Koch, as, as movie, movie moguls go, had a very good reputation of being a really nice guy um you know i, I think uh, there's a veteran b-movie actress called charlotte austin and she called uh, how w Koch the velvet whip and she named him that because he says as a director he was very strident and he knew exactly what he wanted but he she said he always went around things in the nicest possible way he, he's a very well-liked guy for what i answer and the other interesting tip that about uh, how W. Koch and his partner, Bel Air partner, Aubrey Schenk, is that they made a, a, a pact that after they passed away, I mean, they passed away within a few years of each other, they made an arrangement that their ashes were scattered over Kanab, Utah, um, which actually happened. They're, they're, they're playing for over Kanab, Utah, which is where they filmed all their Bel Air westerns. Um, so the, the westerns must have meant something to them. I, I thought it was rather sweet that their ashes were... Uh, um, scattered over Canaan. In fact, just as an, just an aside, um, I noticed that um, the donors have uh, um, a Bel Air Western coming on on Blu-ray. I think it's the first Bel Air Western to make it to Blu-ray, uh, War Drums, yes. um, which was actually directed by Reginald Le Borg. So it's nice. I, I think that will be the first um, Bel Air Western to, to um, make it to Blu-ray. So, But coming back to what I was saying, that you got this incredible pool of talent that was working around the Eagle Line at the time, you know, Arnold Laven, who went on with uh, Levy Garden and Laven, which were, uh, you know, made loads of movies and TV shows and God knows what else. And, uh, you know, the, the uh, Howard W. Koch and Aubrey Shank um, from Bel Air and, and uh, you know, Crane Wilbur and... Um, and Brian Foy. So, uh, yeah, no, not to mention that, how you leave out John Orton and Anthony Mann? So, it's a hell of a, hell of a pull for talent. But uh, why Eagle Lion collapsed, I don't really know. But they, they and another, another very interesting, which I, I came across in an old movie book. Apparently, Harry Sherman, the, the, the vintage producer, Harry Sherman, who had just done a couple of very good John McCrae westerns, Ramrod and um, the uh, Four Faces West. Um, he, he was due to make um, a series of big budget technical westerns with Joel McRae, but unfortunately um, it never never happened. And it might have been, I mean, had that happened, it might have been that Anthony Mann would have directed a, a Joel McRae western shot by John Alton. I mean, it's a bit of a dream, but it, it could have happened, uh, but, but unfortunately it, it didn't. But, uh, uh, but as I say, there was a hell of a talent pool um, yes. Round Eagle Lion at that time, and everybody went on to great heights. Some some greater than others, but everybody did, did pretty well. And, and another very good Eagle Lion film is Crane Wilbur's Cannon City, uh, which is a prison movie, which is exceptional. Again, shot by John Alton, and I hope it gets a, a Blu-ray release. Um, it, it's a very very good movie. We can mention also uh, Road Deal and T Man that are uh, kind of brother films to. He walked by night. T Men and Roy did uh, exceptionally good noirs, and again shot by John Alton. And uh, uh, of course, he walked by night. They're all outstanding films. I, I'd, I'd be very hard to pick a favourite from, from the three, really. I, I mean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they were. Um, I mean, T Men and uh, and Roy Deal are two of man's best movies, really. I mean, they're, they're key Anthony Man works, and a T Man in particular did very, you know, it was a very successful movie in his day as well. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and, of course, John Alton, you know, he, his career didn't end Eagle Lion. He went on to other things as well. But 
it's a pity his relationship with Anthony Mann didn't continue more than it did, really. But uh, there, there you go. I, I mean, um, people may only remember John Alton and Anthony Mann as the people who progressed from Eagle uh, Eagle Line, but there were a lot of other guys as well. So it was quite a, quite an exciting era, and I hope that um, repeat performance and Cannon City get the kind of restorations that classic flicks have done to the two man films and he walked by night that would be a dream come true eagle lion was a very short-lived uh, studio started around uh, 1946 and uh, Ultimately, at the beginning of the 1950s, it was um, bought back, I think, by United Artists. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know a lot about Eagle Line, really. I just know I like the films from that era. Um, I haven't really gone into too much about their, their output. I think they had a time with a British distributor as well, Rank or somebody else. I'm not too, it's just I, I honed in really on, on those outstanding movies they made in their sort of final years. And they did quite a few B movies as well, B westerns. Uh, I think the Leslie Salander one I was talking about. I think it's called the Red Stallion, um, which is a uh, Eagle Line B western in cine color. They they did quite a few of those B type movies as well. But uh, I tend to just hone in on the uh, on those late forties films. I, I mean, I don't really know a lot about their other their other output, unfortunately. And I've never seen any of Alfred Workers, George O'Brien B westerns. I, I'm Seen, I don't think I've seen any of his pre-1939 movies, really. So, um, and w what's interesting about Albert Worker, he never never went into television. I mean, most directors of genre movies, they, they found a second career in, in, in TV, but um, he maybe he didn't appeal to him. I, I don't know, but he, he, there's not one credit for him uh, on TV. He, was, he did those six westerns, more or less, back-to-back, -back, and, and then the final Salmoneo James Whitmore movie, and that was it. And he died quite a long time after um, his last movie. So I hope he had, had a happy retirement and he'd made enough money to not to have to work in TV. But uh, but I, I think that the, the six westerns he made, they're, they're good bread and butter westerns. And uh, you know, uh, and one of them, as I say, that the last posse is is in my my view outstanding. So and there are some pretty good. So. Uh, Hopefully, the unreleased ones will turn up sometime as well. Let's start with The Last Posse in 1953, starring Broderick Crawford, John Derek, Charles Bickford, and Wendell Hendricks. I also really love these westerns, and I would rate it as perhaps a, my favorite of the six, or the, in the top two at least. And I like it because it has a film noir aspect. And as you said uh, earlier, this flashback structure is really innovative and well used. It is told by three different characters. And uh, I'm guessing that when the film was released, it was quite effective because today uh, flashbacks are pretty common and ordinary. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, the, the flashback um, technique is very much a film noir sort of standby really and to have it in a western is, is quite unique and I think it's an exceptionally good western it's very well acted um, Bernick Guffey's photography is outstanding and it, they really use the Lone Pine locations really well I mean Lone Pine looks quite so well Lone Pine you know stands, stands alone if you will I mean it enhances any western really but I thought that Bernick Guffey and, and Alfred Worker really You know, they, they use the um, locations incredibly well. And I hope Sedonis give us a lovely Blu-ray, because I'd love to see The Last Posse in high definition. The Last Posse was made at Columbia, as we said, and it was produced by Harry Joe Brown, who would be, of course, associated with uh, Randolph Scott several times. It has the Columbia feel. There's Broderick Crawford and John Direct that were four years before in Robert Rosson's All the King's Men. And you, you also have Charles Bickford and Wanda Hendricks. In my opinion, this is really a film, a Columbia film that is above the average Western that they did. I, I do love them, but I think there were some, um, I would say, more minor films uh, in terms of uh, production budget. This one, as, as you said, uh, great photography, 
uh, the screenplay is is very interesting and once you start the film you you want to know the ending well you know the ending but you want to know how it we go there yeah yeah i mean it, it, it's uh, and, and i thought Broderick Crawford was sensational i mean a lot of people don't like him in westerns but but i really do i he, he made some very very good ways actually a little aside i i, I know it's a silly thing but what i liked about the 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 the, the last posse um in, in Broderick Crawford's sheriff office, there's like the office cat, and he's wandering around on, on the table, and you know you get this dialogue scene, and and uh, Broderick Crawford sort of feeding his cat, and you know taking care of business, and I thought that was kind of a, I love these little quirky. I mean, the only other Western I can um, recall with with a, a sheriff office cat is uh, Jackson and a Stranger on Horseback, where again the, the cat is very prominent. Uh, wandering around on the sheriff's desk, and uh, I, I, I just like these quirky little touches in westerns, which, which, which kind of, you know, they, they make all the difference. But yeah, I mean, I, but I can't speak highly enough about um, the Last Posse, um, and it's a film that you can watch time and time again. The only, the only fault I would have with the Last Posse, it's not long enough. You know, it's 73 minutes, I think, and. It's one of those movies you, you'd like to know a bit more about some of the characters and some yeah. of the um, you know the, the the relationships and what have you. And there's a kind of strange relationship between this sort of um, Mexican lady uh, and, and Walter Anderson. And they're, they're kind of exchanging sort of, and, and that's not they're exchanging glances and things. It's not really gone into. And I, I think, wow, what was all that about? But the last posse I would like to be maybe 15 minutes longer. And also Stranger on Horseback. I mean, you know, 68 minutes. I mean, what, what was happening there? I mean, again, a movie I, I would like to have been, you know, maybe, maybe at least a quarter of an hour longer. So, but um, I don't know why I refer to the uh, Nerf film. It's just a cat, I guess. But, uh, you know, I, I don't know how many other Westerns have got, um, you know, um, sheriff's office cats in them but uh, there you go <laughs> that's a nice touch and Broderick Crawford also starred in uh, the last uh, of the Comanches by uh, Andre de Tot. that's a good movie I mean um, and it's all you know he was in Fastest Gun Alive and and, and he, he was in some early Universal Westerns as well when the Dalton's Road with Randolph Scott and uh, and another one I saw recently that, that um, came out in France on Blu-ray, um, Badlands of Dakota, which, which I quite enjoyed, Alfred E. Green. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a one of those big-budget um, universal westerns that brings a lot of historical characters into the mix, but it, I thought it was a fun movie. Devil's Canyon in 1953, Starring Virginia Mayo, Dale Robertson, Stephen McNally, and Arthur Unicut. This is a prison film. Uh, and uh, I remember that in this film, J.C. Flippen was tough. And uh, of course, we have the always great Arthur Unicut. And it was shot in 3D. Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, the good news about Devil's Canyon is that it's, it's one of the um, RKO films that Warner Brothers own. And I know they, uh, I mean, I have said they're going to do a remastered version, which will be great. Um, you know, and I mean, they might even do it as a 2D, 3D package, which um, a lot of these 3D movies are coming out um, at, uh, now. Um, I mean, I don't know, because Warner Archive have restored a lot of um, RKO titles recently, um, you know, like Flying Leathernecks, Great Day in the Morning and Underwater. And they look sensational. I mean, the, the, the remastering, is, is, you know, especially, I mean, in those three films in particular, all we've had is washed out um, TV prints, which, which, um, and, and they, they just take on a new life for this wonderful um, remastering. I don't know if you've seen any of the Warner Archive. I bought Sorry. the Great Danes in Morning uh, uh, Blu-ray and I couldn't be more happier as I was accustomed to the older open made transfer with uh, washed out colors it's an incredible pre pleasure to see these films uh, the way they should be so i do hope that uh, devil's canyon is coming and uh, it would be even better in 3d yeah I'm, I'm, i don't have the kit to um show uh, 
movies in 3D, um, unfortunately. Um, I always feel that 3D is very much a cinematic experience, but I'm just happy to have uh, very good t uh, restored uh, 2D versions of, of these films. Um, 3D is really fine, as you like Vincent Price. I, I, I'm thinking about yeah. the movies he made. House of Wax is wonderful in 3D. It's one of the best. And uh, The Mad Magician, which was released by Twi Twilight Time in the US and Powerhouse Indicator in the UK, is also great. There's a lot of gimmicks, a lot of uh, effects. I have the, the chance to, to be able to view the, the 3D uh, Blu-rays, and uh, it's another experience. Yeah, I, I envy you. I, I do have the, I mean, obviously I have the 2D, you know, I have the 3D, 2D packages of uh, House of Wax and the, the Mad Magician and other things like Gun Fury, but I, I don't have a 3D Blu-ray player or a 3D TV at the moment. But I'm, I'm just happy to have these uh, movies in, 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 you know, remastered in 2D. In fact, you probably know that Wings of the Hawk is due um, in 3D and, and 2D from Kino Lorber, I think, next month. So that's something to look forward to. Yes, the, I read the first reviews that are uh, very positive, and it's uh, I think the first time it will be shown in the widescreen 1.85 format. A few months after Taz, Son of Coaches, that uh, Kino Lorber released as well with the 3D Film Archive. Yeah, the 3D Film Archive, they, they do great work. I mean, they might be involved in um, Devil's Canyon, you, you never know. Um, in fact, there's a couple of other RKO Westerns that Warners are supposed to be remastering um, as well. Uh, apart from Devil's Canyon, there's uh, Tension at Table Rock and uh, Treasure of Pancho Villa. So hopefully we get, um, you know, restore versions of, of those two films as well. So going back to Devil's Canyon, uh, is it one of the films you like? Yeah, I mean, I've only seen TV versions and, and seeing it, you know, a, a restored um version from Warner Archive will make you, I mean, it's, it's not a great movie. It's a fun movie. I mean, it's rather silly, really. I mean, uh, it's a kind of hybrid of prison movie and, and Western, but it is kind of cute as well. I mean, it's a gimmicky film, um, but then a couple of workers Westerns were sort of gimmicky, really. Um, but yeah, I, I'd love to see it, um, you know, given a decent restoration you know, the sort of restoration that Great Day in the Morning had. Uh, be, and then you can reappraise the film, you know, sort of the, the, when, you, when you see um, the, these movies such love and care and attention um, as the Warner Archive um, movies have been doing with the RKO films, it, it, it gives them a new life. I'm not saying it's a great Western, but it, it's a bit, I, I say it's a bit of a romp. It's, it's entertaining. It's different. You know, it's a hybrid of two genres and... Uh, uh, it could have turned out well worse than it did. And of course, lovely Virginia Mayo, and she's a, um, you know, a, a great asset to any Western, really. In 1954, uh, he made Canyon Crossroads with Richard Basehart again and Phyllis Kirk. Have you seen that one, uh, Vincent? Um, this is the only one of the six I haven't seen yet. Uh, I think I have a print somewhere, but... Uh... I haven't yet. I, I saw it at a revival cinema back in the 60s. Um, and again, it's a gimmick because it's a modern day Western or what they call a neo-Western. And I, I think is the term they use now. And uh, instead of cattle thieves, you've got uranium thieves. And uh, um, in, instead of uh, horseback chases, you've got helicopter chases. And of course, it reunites um, uh, Richard Basehart with Alfred Worker. So... Uh, yeah, um, I, I remember it being a pretty good little movie, quite rugged, uh, very good location work in black and white. Um, uh, it's a Bel Air Western, and uh, I'd love to. I, I don't hold a lot of hope. Um, of may, maybe, I mean, Sedonis are probably the only guys in town who, who, would, who would release a movie like this now, because as you say, the others seem to have given up on the kind of programmer type movies, and I. I Richard Basehart is great, but I don't know um, if he holds much sway with, um, you know, people putting out movies. But I think it's the sort of thing that might turn up on Sedonis. So it's a good little movie. I remember it being pretty good. And, 
you know, very much an on-location movie. But yeah, again, you're talking about the 1960s, so time does uh, cloud your judgment. But I, I'd love to see it uh, put out on, on at least on DVD. And uh, it was shot in Mohab, Utah. It's interesting because what you said is reflected on the posters. Uh, where we have a tagline, a new kind of Western actually filmed in the Colorado Badlands uranium fields. They really hinted at the fact that it was not a, a classic Western, but uh, it had the location work. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, 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 again, it, it's, a, it's an unusual hybrid. You know, it's a, a neo-Western. It's set in the current day. There's helicopter chases and... Uh, I remember being pretty entertained by it. Uh, I mean, it's not in the league of um, the last posse, but it's none too shabby either. I thought it was pretty good. Um, I'd love to see it get released and reappraised. I mean, if some of these missing worker films surface, um, you know, maybe he'll get some bit more respect uh, out in the community generally. In 1954 as well, he directed Three Hours to Kill with Dana Andrews and Dono Reed. So it was again at uh, Columbia Pictures. Yeah, again, it's a Harry Joe Brown movie. It's kind of a lynch mob movie. It's very entertaining. It's very well made. Um, I'd buy a Blu-ray of it in a heartbeat because I, I think it's quite a, an attractive-looking film. I mean, I'm very pleased with the DVD that I've got of it, but I wouldn't mind an upgrade. Uh, I just think it's an entertaining movie, very fast-moving. Um, and, uh, you know, just as a very good... I mean. Harry, Harry Joe Brown, you know, his, his movies, they, they always, they never look cheap. They always, um, you know, they, they were programmers, but uh, a lot of them, but they always look like, you know, they, they look pretty classy. And there's some interesting shots. Um, the direction's pretty good. You know, there's some unusual camera angles. I, I, I think it's a very fast moving, um, nice little programmer movie, really. Um, and actually, every worker must have been, he must have been, he must have shot pretty quickly because uh, Harry Joe Brown and, and Bel Air, I mean, they didn't like their directors to hang around. Um, it's quite an amusing story about Harry Joe Brown on one of the Randolph Scott movies, um, Gunfighters, um, 1947, I think, uh, George Wagner. Um, Harry Joe Brown turns up on set one day and he finds uh, a whole cast and crew sitting around doing nothing. And there's uh, George Wagner sort of, just looking as if he's like meditating and uh, this does not please Harry Joe Brown. So he goes up to George Wagner and he says, George, what's going on? And uh, George Wagner says, I'm thinking, Harry Joe. And uh, Harry Joe Brown says, the time to think is when you're sitting on the john. Now get back to work. Um, so uh, that was Harry Joe Brown for you, uh, turning up on set um, and most uh, annoyed to find the, the cast and crew doing nothing. But at gunfight, I think George Wagner, he did a good job on that movie. Uh, it's a good-looking movie, so maybe his, uh, his uh, thought process is, uh, you know, had a lot to do with the movie, but uh, he never, uh, Harry Joe Brown never employed him again. But I thought that was quite an amusing story, you know, about the producer, a gaff to see the, the cast and crew sort of sitting around doing nothing. I agree with you that uh, Harry Joe Brown's westerns are generally uh, very interesting, and... Uh, perhaps above average than the Sam Katzman swans. Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, you know, the, I mean, you don't get stock footage and all that sort of thing in Harry Joe Brown movies. I mean, and I mean, the, the actual town scenes, like in, in, in the, the setups, they're, they're, they're pretty good. You know, there's lots of people, lots of extras, and, you know, they don't look cheap. I mean, there's a, sort of some of the town scenes, they, they look pretty amazing, really. You know, The Last Posse does not look like a cheap movie. And not, not just three hours to kill. Um, and they do, you know, they're, they're both very decent entertainments, I think. There was one thing that was reused. It's uh, the music, which we would hear again in a lawless street in 1955 with Randall Scott. And I believe some of the sets on this, on this one uh, I've seen in other Columbia films. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I mean, you do notice certain town scenes, in, you know, in, where you can get that in Paramount and a lot of and, and Fox as well. The kind of town scenes they, they do seem to have a kind of a sameness about them. But uh, yeah, but Three Hours to Kill. I, I mean, I, I take it you you enjoy the movie as much as I do. 
I think it's a pretty decent entertainment. Yes, yeah, it's a very neat Western. And again, I would say that it plays like a film noir where you have this hero played by Dana Andrews that is uh, framed for murder and has to go on the run. There is again a flashback that elevates the film and a wooden it intrigue. So it could have been done on a film noir genre. Here we have a Westerns. You could also substitute Dana Andrews by Randall Scott, because in terms of the screenplay, you have this lone cowboy that lost his wife. You have the vengeance theme. It's a lot like in a Bud Berker movie, like in Decision at Sundown. They're, they're excellent point, especially the, the film noir connection. And um, yeah, you, you could easily see Scott in the, um, in the Dana Andrews role. Um, yeah, I, I think they're, they're very, very pertinent points. Um, and, uh, you know, thanks for raising them. The crew is, all, is again, t- typical of Scott, a Scott film. You have so Harry Joe Brown, you have Charles Lawton Jr. doing the photography, which is uh, really, really good. And uh, it's shot in color. Yes, to me, this is uh, the usual, I would say, Columbia film. And you should understand this as a compliment because it's a really entertaining film and not a long one. No, no, I mean, it, it does what it does in, in, in the time frame. It's fast moving, um, it's well acted, and it is tense. You know, I, I, I like it very much. Um, and there's some very interesting camera angles and shots uh, along the way as well. I, I think it's, um, you know, one of those great Columbia program of Westerns, um, you know, that, 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 that are so good and so underrated. In 1955, um, Alfred L. Walker directed At Gunpoint with Fred McMurray, Dorothy Malone and Walter Brennan. Again, this one has some interesting film noir aspects. I think uh, he really managed to to give it a lot of drama and tension into the film. Yeah, yeah, I think, it, and of course he used this Skip Holmeyer again from The Last Posse. Um, Skip is one of the bad guys in, in this one as well. Unfortunately, um, it's one of, as mentioned earlier, it's one of the Allard artist pictures that uh, Republic now own. Um, and again, I only hope, I think, would be someone like Sazonis. I think it's the kind of movie that they hone in on. Also, it's the only film worker made in uh, Cinemascope. You know, it's the only uh, 2.35 ratio film in his whole career. So it's his, And um, I, I've seen the movie in cinemas, but again, in the 60s, and I enjoyed it very much. Um, I'd love to see it restored in its correct ratio. I think... Um, any version that you might track down would be pan and scan. Um, again, it's the sort of movie that would um, enhance workers' reputation if we could see, you know, a really nice, lovely restoration. They even like the restorations that Warner Archive did on the um, yellowed artist westerns, you know, Wichita and, and so on. If it was restored to that standard, I'd, I'd be very pleased. But a Blu-ray, of course, would be, be even better. But yeah, I, I take your point about the noir aspect and um, it, it, it's a great little program of Western, really. And uh, I like most of all those Fred McMurray later. In fact, Fred McMurray is kind of similar to Worker because he kind of, in, in the fifth, late 50s, he did all these Western kind of program of Westerns. And most of them are very good indeed, you know. And I liked him in Westerns, very good in Westerns. And at gunpoint, is a film that should be out there. It's a great shame that it isn't. Yes, and... Um... Talking about the, the screenplay, the environment of this film is a, is a small town. There is one key scene that takes place as the wind blows, much like in The Last Posse. I love this, uh, this tension that was drawn. At the beginning of the film, I, won't, I will try not to spoil too much, but there is a death of a character, and I think it's particularly well staged when you have a few shots on Fred McMurray and Dorothy Malone, and they really convey the melancholy of the scene. The shots by a worker are really interesting as well. Yeah, I mean, it's a long time since I, I've seen the film, Vincent. Um, you know, I, I uh, tend to, you know, not watch pan and scan TV movies. I've seen the movie a couple of times in cinemas, but you know, a long, long time ago, but it, it stayed with me. I mean, I, 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 a good tension Western. Um, similarities, perhaps, to High Noon in, in some ways. Um, but, yeah, a, a very good cast. Um, 
and and the sort of movie that the kind of western that um, Fred Murray was making. I mean, you know, a lot of uh, very good movies, um, you, you know, that 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 he made at, at, at that time. I think um, I was trying to think, you know, Quantes and um, Gun for a Coward and uh, the, the one with uh, James Coburn, which names escapes me for some reason. Um, uh, but yeah, he, he had a lot of very interesting westerns in, in in the tail end of the fifties. Yeah, Face of a Fugitive. Sorry, mental yes. uh, block there. Yes, I I agree with you. I I also uh, wrote down the similarity with uh, High Noon. Uh, with this main character who is isolated in a town. And uh, also, I'd like to talk about one of the most memorable scenes, in my opinion, uh, and towards the end of the film, where you have uh, Fred McMurray doing a brief monologue about law, about community and bravery. This is really a message that uh, that they try to convey in, uh, in an interesting way and a different way than High Noon, I think. I also, when w watching this film, I, um, I thought it was more violent than the average one of 1955, where you have these scenes with uh, Skippo Meyer uh, shooting um, a member of the family of uh, Fred McMurray that is quite... Uh, uh, shocking. It's certainly a film for rediscovery. I mean, I, I can only recall it from seeing it in cinemas in the 60s. I've avoided, um, you know, I think there's some bootleg DVDs out there, but I don't think they're in the correct ratio. I'd love to see it uh, restored um, in, in, in cinemascope. And uh, I, you raise some very good points that, that make, makes this sort of a cut above your normal allied artist program or Western, really. I mean, it sounds... Uh, it sounds right for rediscovery. His uh, final Western in 1956 is one I love a lot as well, Rebel in Town with John Payne, Ruth Roman, J. Carol Nash, Ben Cooper. This is a pretty impressive film that is well underestimated. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, this is one I, I, I have the DVD um, of, of this film. And um, again, it's Bel Air. Bel Air, um, and it's one of the... Um, Bel Air Westerns, not directed by Leslie Sealander. I mean, um, Alfred Worker did, uh, as you say, the, the um, Canyon Crossroads, and then he, he worked on this one, the, uh, the Rebel in Town. It's a very dark Western, very noirish, and again, like um, like Three Hours to Kill, it goes into you know lynch mob mentality. But there's some very good sort of setups, and the ending of the film is out is very noirish, very dark. Um, which shows the worker was an ideal noir director. It's a pity he didn't direct more film noirs, really. But it is definitely what you call a noir western, and it has something to say. Also, I mean, John Payne is the anti-hero. He, he's not particularly, on purpose, he's not particularly likable. And I found the Ben Cooper character very, very fascinating. Um, I, I think it's one of Ben Cooper's best performances, and... I think it's a, a very underrated film. Um, very low budget. I mean, Bella weren't, uh, maybe all the money went on John Payne's salary. I, I don't know, but um, it, it's different to the colour extravaganzas John Payne did for Pine Thomas um, for Paramount. It's uh, it's pretty low budget, but it, it's very a very powerful movie. Yeah, very well acted and tense, and, and it's got something to say. You know, I thought it was... Uh, a little gem, really. Again, again, another film that that maybe more people ought to um, rediscover, perhaps. And this is a proof that uh, low-budget westerns can be really interesting. You don't need to have a, a technicolor or cinemascope. In this case, it's black and white. It really is a more mature western than the average 1956 westerns we can see. I know that a lot of our members really like this film. I, one of them puts it in his top 10 westerns. So that's saying a lot. Again, th this Western is pretty br brutal, violent for a 1956 Western. I won't spoil the beginning, but you have the death of a key character that is quite unexpected. I don't know if there is any other films of that here that uh, killed off the same kind of character. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it, it's quite, a, as you say, it, it's quite violent for the period. And... 
there's an amazingly well stayed scene with a fight between Ben Cooper and um, and, uh, and and John Payne, where, where he gets his axe, and it's incredibly well staged. Um, and also, uh, Ben Cooper becomes a very sympathetic character, more, more sympathetic than John Payne, really, although he he's um, allegedly a renegade. But it, it's kind of it, it it's sort of um, it, it is very interesting and, and, and very well directed, I thought, considering it's, uh, you know, not, not too big budget. It's, um, and I, I'm very pleased that one of your members is in his top 10 Westerns. I mean, that's kind of, uh, um, you know, nice when these little unheralded gems kind of, you know, find an audience with somebody. Actually, funny enough, the, the Western, um, I forgot to mention, uh, sort of backtracking the allied, uh, the allied artist Western that um, Paramount now own is, of course, Jack Slade, which, which of course we all was is superb, and we'd all love to see that on Blu-ray. I mean, that that is a noir Western if ever there was one. Yes, uh, well, Jack Slade. We also have a member that is a, I can say, a die-hard fan of this film. And uh, every year he asks Sidonis to release it. It was supposed to have come out a few years ago uh, from another French label, but uh, I think the, the trail has gone cold. As you said, the, the axe scene is really uh, innovative in terms of photography, the, the angle, and it was used in the mar marketing material. Yeah, yeah, it's an exceptionally good scene and quite powerful. Um, as, you, as you say, the camera angles and the setup is very, very good. Uh, but it's just a, a really good little movie. Can't speak highly of it enough, really. And uh, would I buy a Blu-ray of it? Yeah, in a heartbeat. Yeah. I loved also the the acting from J. Carol Nash, who's this incredibly good father figure that uses religion to justify its means, uh, quoting the Bible and so on. Is really uh, a wonderful character. Well, not wonderful uh, <laughs> uh, to the first sense of the term, but uh, great acting. Yeah, yeah. In fact, um, J. Carol Nash was in Alfred Worker's last film, the, the Young Don't Cry, I think it's called, which wasn't the Western, but it's, um, but it's an Alfred Worker film. I'd love to see it. I think, again, it's a Columbia movie, um, and it's got um, James Whitmore and, and Sal Maneo. It's one I've never seen, but I, I would really like to, and... Uh, you know, especially having this conversation, I think we've, um, you know, maybe given Mr. Worker the, the respect he deserves. And uh, let, let's hope some of the unreleased movies actually come about. Um, I certainly mm -hmm. hope the um, rumour about repeat performance is true, which I've heard from a very good source that, that it is going to get a lovely... Uh, restoration so let's live in hope at the end of the film what uh, struck me as a similarity with film noir is this uh, ending in the barn that is pretty much like a film noir ending where they get the bad guy uh, getting chased uh, around from the police in uh, in in film noir locations in in the subway uh, or something else this is kind of the same thing so again uh, the film noir impression is pretty uh, obvious in this one, and the tone is very dramatic and tragic. At the beginning, you have this happy family that is really upset by the this whirlpool of events, and uh, Payne and Ruth Roman plays it very well. Both Ruth Roman, I think, is pretty good in this film and really gets an essential role to the story and a more interesting role than uh, she usually got in Warner, or Warner uh, films or other studios. Yeah, I, I agree with you about the lead. Uh, they're, they're superb. And um, I think from the outset, you, you know that uh, John Payne is a flawed character. You know, he kind of, um, you know, the, the, the way he indoctrinates his son, uh, um, you know, he hasn't got over the Civil War. It's kind of one of these post-Civil War films and, uh, and he is a flawed character um he's an anti-hero you know and um of course it, uh, the tragedy i mean in a way it's like a greek tragedy in a western isn't it uh, but but it says a lot you know on a very trim budget which you say a lot about 
how we work as films, really. I think the ending of the film is a good moral message where you suddenly have pain that uh, realizes his mistake. I don't know if it was the intention, but it's a film about the use of guns, basically, because this, uh, this MacGuffin at the beginning of the film is really the, the question that the film raises. Oh, yeah, 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 definitely. Um... It's, uh, I mean, it's quite a, and it's quite a violent film. That's also anti-violent, you know, violent. So, um, but it, it's a, it's an ideal little programmer, really, and uh, and it, it, there's depth there. It's not just just sort of um, supporting feature western. It's uh, there's a lot more going on there, and uh, is um, a nice contrast to the splashy sort of Pine Thomas westerns that that Payne was doing for Paramount. I mean, it's. Uh, It's totally different because it's low budget, it's black and white, um, and he's, he's definitely the anti-hero, um, but he's very, very well staged. And as you say, that the, the blast of violence at the beginning is totally unexpected, and uh, yeah, that ha the film has considerable impact. And it's also interesting, actually, um, Bel Air sort of revived Ben Johnson's career because um, they had it. I mean, he's got a very minor role in Rebel in Town, And then he, he's the second male lead in War Drums. And then they gave him his own show with uh, Fort Bowie, which uh, Howard Koch actually directed. So, they, I mean, Bel Air really were instrumental in um, bringing Ben Johnson back to film audiences after a, a long layoff. To sum up a bit the, those six Westerns, I would say that there are a lot of similarities in them. We have violence in At Gunpoint and Rebel in Town. We have flashback in Three Hours to Kill and uh, The Last Posse, and I think Canyon Crossroads as well. You have uh, this speech about democracy, at least in At Gunpoint. You have gun control in Rebel in Town and At Gunpoint. You have drama, tension, and death. And more generally, it's often well ahead of its time. Did Worker anticipate that um, Spaghetti Western and the 1970s films would be more violent? Yeah, that, that, that's an interesting point. I mean, there, there's certain Westerns that do kind of uh, prefigure the um, Spaghetti's. Um, I, I, one in particular is George Sherman's Last of the Fast Guns. I mean, there's a gunfight in there in, in, the, in the early part of the film. It's things straight out of the Spaghetti Westerns. I mean... The guys who made this big is that they were looking at, you know, American Westerns for their sort of uh, reference points. So um, it's just a shame that Worker kind of never went on to, I mean, even if he'd done some television, I'm sure it would have been quite interesting. I'm sure he could have brought something into to, um, TV movies. It's very unusual for a kind of a genre of filmmaker not to actually go into television. You know, I'm talking about the... the Nathan Durans and Jerry Hoppers and Joseph Pevnes, all those guys, they kind of found a second career in, in, in TV. And it's just amazing that Alfred Worker, you know, didn't, obviously was not interested in, uh, in um, doing TV shows. But I, I think those kind of six Westerns, which we discussed in pretty good detail, I think they were a nice one song for, for his career, really. Which of the six would you re recommend to our audience? The Last Posse, definitely. I mean, that, that's now. I'd say The Last Posse is the only one that's really outstanding. Um, and, and Rebel in Town is very good, as is At Gunpoint. I don't think, I mean, the only one that's kind of maybe a bit silly is Devil's Canyon. But there again, if I saw a lovely restoration of it, I'd probably look at it in a, a different light. I mean, it's a piece of entertainment. Um, I, I don't think, um, I mean, Virginia Mayo in the way she's dressed in that film, I think they would have been a riot on first day with, with her sort of um, very provocatively dressed in, in the prison full of uh, desperate male convicts. I, I think there's kind of that aspect to it, which is, which I'm sure work, work was, a, you know, it, it, the movie's a, a kind of a, it's slight, but, but it's fun. But there again, when, when you see something like Restored, Beautifully restored as, as, as um, you know, Great Day in the Morning and uh, Flying Leathernecks and the others that Warners have done it. These films take on a new kind of dimension. But I think I think the other films, they're all very good. Um, I like your comments about the reoccurring themes. 
Um, uh, you, you make some excellent points there. So yeah, they're, they're, I, I would recommend them all. But I, I just think that the last posse, I, I think that's an exceptional western that deserves to be far better known. Do you know if uh, Worker was happy doing these westerns toward the end of his movie career, or that he would have preferred to make more film noirs or comedies or other genres? It's hard to say. I mean, it's a pity he didn't make more noirs because he obviously had, had a real talent for it. I mean, even. You know, I mean, like he walked by night. It's an outst- uh, there's not a slack shot in the whole film. I mean, the whole film's outstanding. Um, it, it's a very, and it's a film that kind of stands up to repeated viewing. You can uh, watch it and rewatch it. I found that with The Last Posse as well, because I hadn't watched it for a long time. And I put the DVD on and, you know, and, and, uh, and I actually watched it, watched it again because it was so good. You know, sometimes you, you put a film on, you go, wow, th- this film is really, really better than I remember. I mean, I've always had a high regard for the film, but um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think, I mean, don't forget, he'd been going since the silent days. So by the time 1957 arrived, he was probably happy to, you know, enjoy his retirement. And why he became the go-to guy for program and westerns, I, I can't really answer your question. But I think his six westerns that he made at the tail end of his career, they're, they're worthwhile and they, they maybe need people looking out for a bit more. They're, they're all good. They're good entertainments and good films for people to seek out. And the bread and butter westerns, I mean, the, 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 these kind of six westerns were the bread and butter of the genre. And there was a huge appetite for them. The western was at its peak of popularity. So, um, And obviously Worker must have enjoyed making them or he wouldn't have... Um, wouldn't have bothered it have maybe gone on to other genres for some I'm sure he could have but there are a nice kind of swan song to his career which obviously had setbacks I, so I said earlier I, I would have thought the adventures of Sherlock Holmes would have placed him on a higher plane um, I don't know what you know maybe he didn't get on with Daryl Zanuck or something you, you never know about these things but the, the events of the Sherlock Holmes should have maybe raised his career but it didn't and it wasn't until the Eagle Lion things came along that, that he, he got back into gear. And then, 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 of course, the Westerns, I thought, wrapped up his career quite neatly, really. I mean, there's nothing to be ashamed of in any of those films. They're all good, solid entertainments and, you know, a couple of them outstanding, really. I don't know what well, your, your view of them is, Vincent. I mean, you obviously love them as much as I do. So good old Lou Luminick of the um, New York Post, at least saying that work was underrated. You know, it's nice on a high-profile critic, you know, mentioned somebody who's totally unheralded. Well, to tell you the truth, when you suggested this theme, I thought it was a great idea because a uh, worker really needs to be rediscovered as uh, uh, his films are underappreciated. When I prepared this podcast, I rewatched uh, At Gunpoint and Rebel in Town. Not only are these low-budget westerns, which is not uh, a bad thing, but they're entertaining movies, but at the same time, they also have great photography, as you pointed out earlier. And uh, when I, I watched Rebel in Town several times, I thought, yes, this shot is really good. As well as being entertaining, they're very deep films. I can see a message, at least in At Gunpoint and Rebel in Town. My memories of the other are uh, more uh, far. But um, so I think that they're above average B films, and they really have qualities. You need to rewatch them. Uh, it's like the Randolph Scott films. It's, for me, the, I would say the best Columbia's uh, B westerns that you can watch. I couldn't agree more. John, would l- you like to say uh, a few final words about uh, Alfred uh, Worker before we conclude this podcast? I'd like to say thank you very much for your invitation. Um, I'm quite humbled. Um, that you, you've asked me to um, join your wonderful podcast. So I'm, I'm, I'm very indebted to you. And it's been a pleasure um, talking to you and, and also getting your, your viewpoint on a lot, a lot of these work of films. I mean, there's obviously a lot going on under these movies that, 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 that maybe people realise. Uh, um, I can't really say more than we've already said, except uh, I, I agree with you. He's right for rediscovery and maybe... You know, if we get a lovely restoration of peak performance and by a miracle, at gunpoint is given a Blu-ray 
in, in cinema scope and uh, Canyon Crossroads suddenly turns up. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm sure that will help his reputation. But you know, there, there's always fans out there that l look at these um, unheralded directors. You know, there's always somebody who's going to be um, interested um, in them. So um, I, I chose him because I, I just like the, um, the fact he, he closed his career, more or less, with these six very interesting Westerns. Again, thank you very much for the invite. It's been a been a blast. Well, thank you for coming, for taking the time to talk with us. It was lovely for me to, talking to you. You have such a great and passionate knowledge of Western, and I hope our audience will want to watch or rewatch uh, all the films we mentioned. This was, I think, a great opportunity to showcase a director that not many of us really appreciate for his value. I hope we get to do another podcast uh, someday, perhaps about Leslie Cylinder that you mentioned to me. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I must thank Chris Wicking for, for um, you know, turning me on to Leslie Cylinder. I mean, I got to know Chris quite well, and we say little soirees at his flat off the Edgware Road, and he would show movies on his living room wall, and uh, he was... Um, You know, it's nice to sort of meet other movie fans at his uh, sort of little soirees. And then, of course, he became, you know, a, a screenwriter of um, a, a, of note, really. Uh, sadly, he's no longer with us. He passed away a, a few years ago, but he, he was a very successful screenwriter. I, I remember at the iView Film Club, they, they would show sort of um, a main feature, a serial, um, King of the Rocket Men or something, and and a short and a cartoon. They tried to make it as much like a, an actual visit to the movies as possible. During the coffee break, he, he would show sort of bits from his own collection. I, I, I remember him showing a clip from a Hopalong Cassidy movie, which had Hoppy sort of um, riding along in Lone Pine uh, from a Leslie Sealand to Hopalong Cassidy. And, um, and he would wax lyrically, uh, lyrical about it. And I thought, wow, you know, th this guy's really into... There's this Lander, so I, I, I got him to thank for, for my um because I hadn't really given Les, I mean I just knew Leslie Slander as the director of uh, Laramie, which was one of my favourite Western TV um, series. But uh, yeah, Chris kind of um and also the article he wrote on Shotgun. So I started um trying to track down every Leslie Slander movie. I mean I like a lot of his non um, Westerns as well, but as you say, maybe, maybe that's something for another time. Yes, I would appreciate it. So thanks so lot, John. Uh, Cowboys and Cowgirls, that was the Western Movies podcast. Go West. Thank you for listening and long live the Western. <laughs>